So a little bit of context here in Job chapter 14. This is the fourth time Job has gone after his friends in a a soliloquy type way. This rant that he's currently on begins in chapter 12. And it begins with this. And Job answered and said, No doubt you are but many people, and wisdom shall die with you. In other words, you're the masses. Is wisdom going to be caught up because each one of you are wise, but then collectively as a whole, wisdom is going to die. You know, there's an old saying that I, I heard one time. It says, if a motion is on the table that you're not quite comfortable with or don't want to really address, send it to committee and it'll die in committee. And Job is saying this to his friends, that basically you've become a committee and the committee has made you foolish. Job continues on with verse 3 in chapter 12. But I have understanding as well as you. I am not inferior to you, yea, who knoweth such things. I am as one that is mocked of his neighbor, who calleth upon the name of the Lord, and he answered him, and just upright man is laughed at and scorned at. Isn't that an interesting thing that Job is identifying here? That those that listen to God and have a relationship to God are even mocked among the brethren? And that's the beginning of this rant that we're on in Job. And then chapter 13, we can surmise that as a very good and eloquent observation that there is perfect order to the universe, that God is sovereign over all things that happen in this cosmos that we're in, that whatever happens has been preordained, foreordained by God, who's not only given it permission to happen, but also allowed it to happen, and in some cases has orchestrated it to happen. That's a very tough pill to swallow. When we look at the brokenness, when we look at the things going on in our communities that aren't right, when we look even inside of our own church and see the the dealings with pain and the suffering and why am I going through this, to know that sometimes God has orchestrated that. That sometimes God says, go get them. You think they don't trust me? Go prove the point and see how well they trust. And that's a hard pill to swallow. And then here we get into chapter 14. And the natural reaction to what Job is going through is a feeling of hopelessness. We see that in verse 2. For man cometh forth like a flower and is cut down. He was here for a time and he's been cut down. And then what happens? The rest of chapter 14 is Job asking, what happens to man when we die? A flower has hope, but does man have hope? Job's answer here is no. Because he's only looking at it in the natural. How often do we ask the question, what am I going through? Why am I going through this? God, do you have an answer? But I have no hope. I don't believe that the answer you're giving me is the correct answer. Because it's not the answer I would have chosen. But the thing that we get from chapter 14 and the first couple of verses there is that God has numbered our days. And this idea comes from the Psalms in Psalms 90. So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Return, O Lord, how long, and let it repent thee concerning thy servants. O satisfy me, O surly, with thy mercy, that we may rejoice and be glad in all our days. The Lord has already numbered our days. 
do we recognize it? We say, tomorrow I have to go to work in the morning. Tomorrow, next week, I have X amount of stuff to do. But do we realize that each one of us could be knocking on death's door in two minutes or ten seconds? Have we numbered our days? Have we lived life to the fullest? Have we glorified God in all of our lives, every moment of every day, so that when he comes and may take our life from us, or when he comes and catches us up with him, that we're ready, and that we will hear, as Becky prayed this morning, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But we all have a date with death. We see it in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, and if you're familiar with the old songs uh, from the birds, to everything there is a season and a time and purpose under the heaven, a time to be born and a time to die. There it is. Our time to die has already been pre-appointed. A time to plant and a time to pluck that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather the stones back together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose. A time to keep and a time to cast down, cast away. A time to rend and a time to sow. A time to keep silent and a time to speak. A time to love and a time to hate. A time of war and a time of peace. That everything that we go through can be summed up in these first eight verses of Ecclesiastes chapter 3. And that God has ordained and foreordained and has orchestrated each one of those periods of times in our life. But just like we all have a date with death, there's nothing you can do to make your life shorter or to make your life last longer. I once read a statistic that for every pound of bacon you consume, you take 10 years off of your life. <laughs> if that were true, I did the math, I should have died in 1600. <laughs> but there's nothing we can do to change the outcome of our life. Just last week, on, on Saturday morning, a husband and wife in Troutdale, Oregon, had an appointment to go to Costco together. But she wasn't feeling very well. She decided to stay home, sleep in a little bit, and her husband went off to Costco and left her in bed. Twenty minutes later, an airplane with mechanical failure fell out of the sky, impacted that home killing the pilot, the flight instructor, and the lady that decided to stay home that day. When you have an appointment with death, nothing can stop it. Had that lady gone to Costco, who knows what other way God would have orchestrated that death to happen. Conversely, back in 1972, there was a suitcase bomb that blew up in a seven... Actually, it was a DC-3 at the time. But anyways, blew up in an airplane. The flight attendant was cast out of the airplane at 34,000 feet. Fell all the way to the earth and lived until 2016. When you have an appointment with death, there's nothing you can do to cause that to come early. And there's nothing that you can do to speed it up. And God is sovereign through it all. Isn't that what we read in James chapter 14? When we read, life is but a vapor. 
See, it's like when you have that cold cup of, or the warm cup of coffee on a cold day and you see the steam rising and it lasts for just barely a moment. That is what our life looks like. That we are only here for a short period of time. God says in Genesis that as a result of sin, man's life shall be no greater than 120 years. So we know we have a timeline, but within that timeline, what does it look like? Because we're here for just a short period of time, and then we vanish away. Well, let's look in that story that uh, our kids was told in the book of Acts, chapter 20. And upon the first day of the week, when the disciple came together to break bread, Paul preached unto them, ready to depart on the morrow, and continued his speech until midnight. All day long, Paul, Paul was quite winded, wasn't he? And there were many lights in the upper chamber, and they were all gathered together. And there sat in a window a young certain man named Eutychus, being fallen into a deep sleep. He just wasn't dotting off. He fell asleep, and he was out cold. He fell into a deep sleep. And as Paul was walking along preaching, he sunk down with the sleep and fell down out of the third story, out of the third loft, and was taken up as dead. And Paul went down and fell upon him. And embracing him said, trouble not yourselves, for his life is in him. And when he therefore came up again and had broken bread and eaten and talked for a long while, even until daybreak, so he departed. And it brought the young man alive, and they were not a little comforted. It's like this young man falls out of the window. Paul says, he's all right. Let's get back to preaching, just like, just like Gary said. And they weren't comforted by the fact that he could just carry on after this young man fell through a third-story window. So God has numbered our days. We have a date with death. And there's nothing we can do to change that date. So let's ask this question. Does this bring us sorrow or joy? If we look in Thessalonians, First Thessalonians, Chapter Four. Starting in verse 14, we read, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus with God, or will God bring with him. For in this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. We all have a date with death. But if you believe that Christ died your death, rose again, paid your penalty, and is now seated with the Father on the throne in the heavens, then one day, even though this body fails, even though you die here, you will be caught up with Him in the clouds. And what a time of rejoicing that will be. Let's continue the point in Revelation and the 12th chapter. Fourteenth chapter, rather. Verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Write, Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yea, saith the Spirit, that they may rest from their labor, and their works will follow them. And I looked, and beheld a white cloud, and upon the cloud sat one like the Son of Man, having on his head a golden crown, and his hand a, a sharp sickle. Blessed are they which die in the Lord. 
What a hope that we have if we are his and die that way. But all too often, getting back into Job and the 14th chapter, how many of us feel the hopelessness that Job felt? In verse 13, Job says, you hide me in the grave, and that's where I stay. In verse 10, he says, but man dies and wasteth away. What a hopelessness that Job felt. And this is kind of where nihilism comes into play. This is the idea that there's only this earth, there's only this life, and nothing else beyond it matters. And if there's no hope in Christ, if you have not received the hope of Christ, then looking at what may come later seems a bit helpless. Seems a bit hopeless. You know, psychologists tell us that there's a series of births and deaths in our life. That when you become a toddler, your, in, your infant self dies. And then as you progress life, as you progress from one stage to the other, your previous self dies and your, and your new self is born. Why would we look at death, the final death, any different? That we can either step from death into a new life with Christ, or we can step into this physical body's death and into eternal hell and damnation far away from anything that is good. Genesis 6 tells us that the, the, heart, the thoughts and the heart of man are can totally and consistently evil, not capable of any kind of good, because we are, by default, separated from Almighty God, from the goodness of God. And I believe that, that is what hell is, is a complete and total separation from God, where only things that are evil will fester, and the depths of that evilness cannot even be known. So do we have sorrow or do we have joy as we knock on death's door? Let us think on these things and close in prayer. Father, thank you for this day. Father, as we look at the uncomfortable truth that is what happens after life. We pray that we are comforted by the fact that you're with us and that one day we'll be reunited with you. But Father, if those are here that don't have that hope, that don't know that hope, I pray that you would impress it upon their hearts. Father, pray that you give us strength and power to walk into this next week and let us proclaim your name boldly in every interaction. We pray all these things in the name of our mighty Savior, Jesus. Amen. In just a minute, Gary's going to pray, or going to play some music and sing. If you need to come down to the altar and pray, it's open.